So, hi everyone. Welcome to the Portland Art Museum. I'm just thrilled to see you all here on this lovely rainy Portland afternoon. <laughs> Isn't it nice <laughs> to have it back? Um, I'm also just really excited to be here because I have enjoyed several of these talks myself. Gabe Flores, who's in the audience, spoke here recently a few months ago. Um, Avantika Bawa spoke here a few months ago. I just think it's really amazing to look close and important to think cl to look closely at one work of art for a long time, honestly. Um, how often do we get to do that? I mean, as a teacher, I sometimes get to make my life so that that happens, where we look at one student's artwork for like an hour or something like that, you know? But it does make a huge difference if you spend from the difference from like two minutes that many people spend looking around a gallery to like instead to more like half an hour or an hour. You just see new things, you change your mind, you understand it in a whole new way. So I'm excited to engage with Sophie Cal's work with you guys for the next half hour or so in this way. So there's a bunch of things I might like to go over today. I mean, it's some of this is a bit of an improvised talk. I've never talked about Sophie Cal in front of an audience like this before, but I'm excited to because she was one of the artists that I was most interested in in graduate school. I'm not sure what kind of bio um, exactly you got about me, but I maybe just to mention again, I'm a filmmaker, artist, I teach at Portland State University, I'm from outside New York City, but I flung myself out here in 2007. Um, but before that, I was living in Buffalo, New York, and that's where, and I was doing a master's program in experimental and documentary media. And that's where I first learned about Sophie Cal's work. Um, I kind of, I wrote my master's thesis on a certain kind of female conceptualism I was interested in. It included artists like Adrian Piper, uh, Sophie Cal, Jillian Waring, maybe these are ringing some bells for people. Um, and so I was just really interested in the particular type of conceptual art that these and other women were doing that was very much still, it didn't have the kind of distance clinical coolness that other kinds of conceptual art had that was very much about systems or things like that. You know, it had this other element to it where it was still organized around an idea, but was very personal, playful, uh, often autobiographical in some way. So that, I mean, the work I was doing then was very much in along those lines, and I can talk about that a little bit more later. But this just brings you to like why when I walked around the museum several times in the past few months looking for a work to engage with and talk with you guys about. This is the one that stuck out to me most just because it came from a really personal place. There are all kinds of other moves I considered making that had to do with critique of institutions and class, you know, all kinds of stuff that I'm also interested in. But I decided to go this route, which we can still, of course, critique it through many lenses. Um, but I also wanted to just kind of share some of my enthusiasm for this artist um, and talk about how her work has been a big influence on me too. Um, so a couple of things I thought we might do. I thought we would start with, how many people know much about her work? Anybody? Sophie Cal, French artist, you've heard about her maybe a little bit. Uh, so Sophie Cal is the artist we're talking about today. Sophie, Sophie Cal. Um, and uh, good, that's great. Um, I thought I would tell you a little bit more about her and some of her other projects. And because she is a conceptual artist, there's like lots of stories I can tell you because lots of her work, I'll show you some images too. I brought some books to pass around. I felt like going low tech this time. I considered making a PowerPoint and just like froze up and couldn't do it, you know? I was like, I just do this too much in my like work life at PSU, like making presentations and stuff. And so I just thought we'd go low tech and pass pretty books around. Because I think it's another thing I want to talk about is the way her work lives in like museums and installations and galleries, but it also lives in book form in a very big way, which I think is interesting um, and, and disseminates her ideas much further um, in a lot of ways. So, so I thought I would tell you about some of her works. Uh, so you have some idea where this one is kind of situated in her um, kind of practice. And then we would turn to the handout. Now I really feel like a teacher. Can you tell I'm a teacher? <laughs> so then we will all turn to our handout and read it together. And then I'll tell you, not yet, don't turn to your handout yet. And then we will... Um, uh, look really closely at this, like I was saying, I want to do. I want to see what you all see in it, too, even just as an object in front of you, now knowing a little bit more about it, but also just analyzing it um, through a lot of different lenses. I think, I think we might even play a little game of putting on different lenses. What does it look like through the right lens of gender and class and race, nation, and so on? So we'll get to that, though. Let me tell you about this lady, though, okay? So she's from France. She's... Uh, 
born in 1953. So that makes her, who's really good at that now? She's what, 63 now? 63 years old? 64, Something like that? No, no, she's one of the younger, she's 63, yeah. Okay, everything is in relation to you or eight. Yeah, that's great. So, um, this is about you. yeah, <laughs> no, yeah, 63 she is. So, um, and tell, just to give you a bunch of other projects, and I want to send this around. Here's one of the lovely books that she has had produced. You can check it out. Um, let me tell you a few works. So, one of her earliest ones is 1979. Um, it's called Sweet Venetian, and it involved um, her meeting someone at a party in Paris, a man. A lot of her stuff has to do with her relationship to men uh, or people she's in a relationship with. And she met a man in Paris. She learned that he was going to Venice, and she followed him to Venice. And she decided to make a project out of this. And she documented, you know, kind of surreptitiously following him around Venice, taking pictures. And then she eventually presented the resultant images, not unlike this, where she had images of what that following had been like with text about like her observations, right? Like she does this a lot, this text image thing. So that was one early piece where she, uh, people have, connected her to Vito Acconci. Do people know his following piece? He was a conceptual artist working in the 60s and 70s. He's still working. Um, he did a piece similar, um, but in New York City where he had a kind of game where when someone, he would find, identify someone on the street and follow them until they went into what he called a private place. You know, so here they were in public, eventually they were in private. So I read one time that they talked about their parallel practices that were happening around the same time, um, but they were not necessarily in conversation before that. It's just one of those things or things evolve at the same time. Another one that brings up some ideas about public and private space and intimacy is called The Sleepers. And all of these early ones, especially are documented in this book. This one is also from 1979. This one is where she invited people to sleep in her bed for eight hour shifts. Um, and she did this over the course of a week. And she would talk to people, but then let them fall asleep, and then she would document it. And then when you, the resultant images were, all, were presented as a big grid of all these sleepers and what it had been like for them to sleep over these eight-hour shifts over the night. And so it was interesting to re-engage over the past few weeks with this. I got lots of read my books again that I'd had from 13 years ago when I was in graduate school. Because um, I noticed different things that I hadn't noticed the first time around. Um, like. Like one thing I think is pretty significant is that she was conscious of like who would be awake at those certain or who would who would need to sleep like during the day. She was like, oh, bakers get up at like three in the morning, and then they or whatever they have crazy schedules and have to sleep during the day. You know, so she actually went to bakeries and tried to meet bakers and tried to bring them into this project. It wasn't necessarily just friends or things like that. Like she kind of is interested in bringing strangers into her work, but also I think there's just I guess I'll talk more about this later. It's kind of related to just some things I, I hadn't noticed before about her consciousness around like work and who's working and who's working when and how does society function and how do we like share everything and so on and make it all work. Because um, this comes up with some other projects she's done too, this idea of work. Um, another project is called The Shadow. Similar, it's maybe a response to the one from two years before following the guy in Venice where she, her, she had her mom hire a detective to follow her around for an entire day so, um, and take pictures. So what Sophie did is she went around Paris to places that were important to her um, that emotionally or you know, had some psychological you know, resonance for her. Um, but when, in the resultant documentation, you don't get any of that. It's just these kind of you know, banal clinical photos on the street. Um, and then she also um, displays them like this too with images and text. Another one that I really love that is documented in here um, is called the, Cham the Hotel. This one is where she went back to Venice a couple years later, we're only in 1981 now, and she uh, got a job as a chambermaid, so here's the work thing again, and she 
Um, while she was cleaning up people's rooms, she would document their belongings. Uh, do people know about these works? Because to me, it's like so much something I think about all the time, but I'm like, is this new that an artist would do this? So, so, and they're beautiful photographs too. That's why I felt the need to bring the book. Like, they're not just like conceptual projects where the documentation is kind of secondary to the idea. Like, she made these really gorgeous color photographs of the objects that she'd find in people's rooms and she would, you could tell that she really arranged them in the suitcase. I mean, she's touching these people's stuff, you know? She arranged them in the suitcases in a certain way um, and, uh, and then would do the same kind of text image documentation kind of project like you see here. And, um, you know, and so she's, doing these things that maybe are ethically dubious, you know, should people be doing these kinds of things? With, um, but she is, she was doing them. It gets, she takes it one step further. This is what, this, this next project from 1983, I think she got a lot of pushback on and eventually turned a little bit more of inward and look, took the camera kind of looking at herself a bit more. This next one is called The Address Book. Um, and this one involves her finding an address book on the street in Paris and then she photographed every page of it, or, or photocopied every page of it, and returned it to the owner. But at the same time, she had, and she had the opportunity to um, sh do a project with a newspaper, a daily newspaper, had said, do you want to have like an article every day? It's an art project, right? So she decided, I'm going to call and meet with someone from this address book, um, and then I'll f I ask ask them about this guy, you know? And then I'm gonna publish the results in the newspaper. So this was the one that went the furthest. Um, and so, and, I, and there's something, I'm, I'm just really interested also in the commitment to these. Like she didn't just talk on the phone to people, she wanted to meet people for coffee. And so um, you can read more about all these projects. The people would tell her about the guy. Some people didn't know a lot about her. Some people, or the guy in the, who owned the address book. Some people did know a lot about the guy. Um, eventually, the guy found out and was very upset and threatened to sue her for something, you know, some violation of privacy, something like that, you know. And also, yeah, no, I know, I know. And so, and also threatened to publish a nude photograph of her. But I never found out if he really did that in what I've read. But um, so then after that, she did some projects that didn't have that same kind of tension exactly. Um, like a few years later, she did a project called The Blind, where she, oh, sorry, I'm touching my little thing here. I'm a filmmaker. I know you're not supposed to touch these, and here I am playing with it. Um, so, um, a project called The Blind, where she interviewed blind. A lot of her stuff involves interviewing. I mean, this is, you can see why as a filmmaker, I'm kind of drawn to this work too. She's using a lot of documentary strategies. Um, she interviewed blind people and asked them what uh, beauty was like to them or what it looked like to them. And my understanding is these, are, these were people who were blind their whole lives. So a lot of it was imaginings, you know? Um, and then she would photograph something that they had talked about and then present a photograph of the individual and the text. Um, and so, that, and then another project she did though that was very important to me as a uh, you know, young artist in graduate school is a project she did called No Sex Last Night from 1992, which is, I believe, one of her few vi video projects. Oh my God, hi. Um, where this one involved a relationship she was in with a man um, Greg Shepard, who this project is also about, which we'll get to. Um, she, they were having a rocky relationship, so they decided to make a video together and go on a road trip together. And they both had video cameras. This is in the 90s, so it was like these little handheld camcorders. And they drove across the US. He was an American photographer. And they drove across the US together um, and made diary videos about their experience. They talked to the camera. They each did it. There's these great moments where they're both, they have the camera on each other, and it's in the frame, and they're talking to each other, and it cuts back and forth, you know, and they're having these arguments. Eventually, it's like an hour long video video. Eventually they go to Las Vegas and they go through a drive-through Elvis wedding thing and they get married in Las Vegas. 
Um, it's also called, the piece is called No Sex Last Night, also double blind, like an experiment, like we both have these cameras and we're doing our experiment, but it's also called No Sex Last Night. And that's because almost every day in the video, the first thing Sophie says in the morning to the camera is no sex last night, because they, they, they were having some trouble in their relationship. So, um, so that, was, that, that, that kind of like filmmaking too, or video making, was really influential on me as a younger artist, because I was just really interested in that kind of setting up things and seeing what happened way of working. I mean, it's still basically the way I work on almost every project is, is to kind of carefully consider what those elements will be that we'll set up, but then to just really be present and see what comes of it, and then process the results later like she did, like they made this video together afterwards. I heard that, I read that it was difficult for them to edit that together. Um, they weren't having the best time. Um, a f just a couple other projects. I mean, isn't this fun to talk about? It's like story hour, telling you all these like these these things that actually happened in the world. You know, uh, yeah, yeah. The, these risks she took, or. Um, Another one that's interesting, the writer Paul Oster was kind of fascinated by her, and hi, <laughs> it's fun to see all these familiar faces, um, was kind of fascinated by her and wrote her into, well, wrote a character based on her um, into one of his books called Leviathan. I haven't actually read that book, but um, there's this character named Maria in there, and he, so he wrote this character based on this artist who does all this stuff with her everyday life and so on. Um, but then she read it and she decided to take some of the parts he'd fictionalized and make them real. For example, he had made the character have this kind of tick where she um, every day would eat things of only one color, like an orange day where everything was orange and a green day where everything was green and so on. Um, so she actually did that for a while, you know, and became the character, you know, so it was this fact fiction mixing thing happening, you know, it had started out as fiction, but then she made it real, so now what is that fiction? And, and she made, of course, again, as always, like these photo projects that have these carefully composed, beautiful color photographs with the text and so on. Um, and then also, and she made that called Chromatic Diet. Um, a couple more relationship ones, and then leading up to like what's one of her like most amazing projects, I think. Um, this one, Exquisite Pain, was another one that she did where someone had broken up with her. This is in 2003. And she was very distraught by this. And she decided to um, ask people what their most painful moments were in life and as a way to kind of, you know, cathartically get through this, like to tell people what was her pain was, but hear what theirs was. And maybe by, you know, comparison, her pain would diminish, you know, or seem less um, important. And also just the repetition. She did this like 90 something times. And again, she took photographs, made text to tell you this story so you could see it all. Um, this one is hilarious, and I encourage you all to go get it immediately. I almost brought the book, it's just so big. Um, it's called Take Care of Yourself. So it's another breakup a bunch of years later. She keeps getting involved in breaking up, as many of us do. I think a lot of us can relate. Um, so, um, so in 2007, she did this project called Take Care of Yourself, which involved, which was at like, the Venice Biennale, it was like it had a lot of production, you know. She, what happened was someone broke up with her over email and she took the email and she asked 107 people, do you know this one? It was kind of a big thing at that biennial. Um, and she asked them to, she asked 107 people to analyze this email, this like breakup email. And it's not just any old 107 people. It gets back to this kind of labor and professions thing. Like she asked a lot of artists and performers and they did interesting things. And, so, and it was in the installation version. There's videos and there's the text image stuff. Um, the book version gives you just like text with like these analyses and images. Um, but she asked people like, like journalists, lawyers, ling like, Actually, people, a lot of people deal with language analysis in the first place, you know, various linguist type people, I don't know, all this kind of specialists I didn't even know existed, you know, um, who offer these like, 
like all over and over, or she also even asks like a teenager, you know, like a girl, like what did you think? And hers is very short and it's just like, it sounds like he loves her but can't be with her, you know, like, which is basically what all the others say too, you know, <laughs> um, but just in this much more sophisticated kind of like, well this, she asks like various kinds of psychoanalysis, psychoanalysts and psychologists and stuff like that. I mean, it is so funny. It's, I can see why it's like so, it's gotten a lot of attention. It's, I mean, it's funny and super sad, and you know, and I think a lot, a lot of people can relate, you know, to that kind of breakup email that is totally like, it's just, it's not nothing new. I just am going through a lot, you know. It's totally all about and and how they're not really responsible for anything. It's just things are hard right now, and you know, stuff like that. Um, some people relate, maybe. And so, um, and uh, so, so find that book. I interlibrary loaned it the past few weeks and had a blast reading it. Um, and um, maybe that's a good time to check out this one. I lost my watch recently, so I like don't know what time it is ever, but we're fine. Oh my gosh! How did I? Sorry. Uh, I'm gonna go on all night here. We gotta look at the mo the picture. Um, the movie. I'm so used to looking at movies. Um, where were we here? Let's read the book. Yeah, well, I don't know. It's just there's a lot to say. So um, let's turn to our handout. Um, so this project. And I guess just one more thing about all of her works that I just think is interesting from the books I passed around. She makes these beautiful books. Like if you get interested, you know about this if you're interested in her work already. Like she makes these lovely books or someone involved with her does. Um, she has, you know, gallery representation and makes these pieces that are editioned and so on. But she, a lot, most, I, mean, I would say almost all of her work is also available through libraries in these lovely little artist books that often present it differently, you know? It's a different experience to see, like, where is it? This piece is right in here. Um, it's a different experience to see it small like this. But, uh, but if you're interested in, I mean, because there's also this relationship to, like, storytelling and, you know, um, in a lot of the work she's doing. And this is a different way to engage in a more individual way. Um, so most of the projects I told you either have their individual book or they're kind of in compilations, like the book I'm passing around, or just something I think is kind of interesting. So, um, no, a few were there, but most of them I just interlibrary loaned and... The, the libraries in the community responded to my call for Sophie Cow work, and it all appeared at the library. So, um, um, yeah, or, or they sell a couple downstairs. The, the address book one I mentioned is on sale downstairs. I don't know if it's on, it's for sale downstairs. <laughs> it's, it's, it's deeply discounted tonight because of this talk. Um, so, Let's look at this. So this series, I thought you might like to know more about, is called The Husband, that this one is a piece of. Um, it's a 10 work series. And as you see here, it says 10 short series, stories. So I think it's sort of interesting to like, I don't know, as artists, we're also aware of like our huge, not our huge, our like, our oeuvre, you know, like and how every piece relates to the next one and, you know, so it's always interesting to see something like out of, you know, this is just the one that is actually part of the kind of narrative here. Um, so I thought we might look at it together. Do you guys want to do that? All right. So, um, so what about... Can we do it, guys? Will you all read one little story? I'll read one also. But if you guys wouldn't mind volunteering, I think it will help us understand this one. Why is there a naked guy here? It will become apparent in a moment. Gabe, would you mind reading the first one? Sure. The resolution, number one. I met him at a bar in December of 1989. I was in New York for a couple of days. The offer let me stay in his apartment and I accepted. He gave me the address and the keys and disappeared. I spent the night alone in his bed. The opening of the bathroom came from a piece of paper that I found under a cigarette box. It said, Resolutions for the New Year. Your wine, your life. Later, I called him from Paris with May. We decided to meet and made a date for January 20th, 1990. Early airport at 9 a.m. He never arrived, never called, did not answer his phone. On January 10th, 1991, at 7 p.m., I received the following call. It's Brent Shepherd. I am at Orly Airport, one year late. Would you like to see me? <laughs> this man knew how to talk. 
So many of us would see that as a red flag, but, <laughs> yeah, but not Sophie Cal. Does anyone want to read the next one? I think we have time to read these little stories. Okay. Yeah. The hostage. Then what happened? Me? The argument. Tuesday, March 10th, 1992, at 11.50 a.m., he threw the following in my direction. An empty tea kettle, a butcher's block, a yellow love seat, four pillows, a biography of Bruce Nauman, and a black phone. When the phone hit the wall, I understood it would be preferable to meet his request and listen. By 1 p.m., everything was back in order except for a hole left in the wall. I hid this last bit of evidence Now, this is the one we're looking at here. Sure, yeah. Uh, Nisha, no matter how hard I try, I never remember the color of a man's eyes or the shape and size of his sex. But I decided that a wife should know these things. So I made an effort to fight this amnesia. I, know, I now know I need a three men. We'll come back to that one. <laughs> There's just a few more. The erection. We drove across America every morning, uh, contemplating the bed we slept in. I would whisper the same refrain, no sex last night. This went on for 15 days until we arrived in Las Vegas. There, I, was, I, I pursued him to marry me. That night, the no became a yes. Later, he confessed that his desire sprang from the fact that I was now his wife. An erection was the first thing marriage had given me. There are five more. Well, we'll sum it up with they break up eventually. <laughs> um, and you're missing the very last page. Um, but uh, you can read them yourselves. Um, she did eventually have a fake marriage, as you see here. Um, as in, like, got people together and wore a white dress because she'd only done the drive through thing. Something I think is interesting is how these things come up in different projects, too. Like, I told you about the video project. Here it is again, the same story, um, told very differently. Um, and eventually they get divorced. Um, let's look a little closer at this and then talk a little bit for questions. I don't want to keep you all night, but... Um, I think there's a lot of things to think about with this or notice. Um, I mean, feel free to jump in with your own ideas, but now that we have some sense of like the how and why or idea behind this, um, just looking at it as an art object though, I mean, the first things I noticed when I came in here to hang out and pay close attention to it had to do with the scale, that it's you know very large scale, closer to life size. I imagine it's not exactly life size because it's kind of my size and this dude is probably a little bigger than me, but I don't know. Um, yeah, it's pretty big. And, but also, this, there's this, the head's cut off. This is a big deal. The text is put in the place of the head. That's interesting. Um, also, there's some things like the way the text is laid out. I mean, you guys are a little farther away. Um, is, well, it's somewhat interesting to me because I worked as a grant writing assistant for many years, and this kind of thing drove my grant writing 
director nuts, like to have what she called like these few words hanging out like this. She didn't. She called it marrying the widows. She wanted those to somehow be formatted. She was nuts, you know, and so so that you wouldn't have this sense of like, you know, like sameness, sameness, and then weird little fragment, you know. Anyway, yeah, no other art critic is going to tell you that, but that's what I noticed is that I flash back to this traumatic experience of working in a museum, writing grants, and having to rewrite them over and over. So other things I notice. Um, well, you know, it's a black and white image, which already takes us into this other world. You know, it's not color like the real, the world that we're existing in here. There, this person is on a sheet, it looks like. So we're kind of immediately looking down on them in a bed, it seems like to me. Um, as the text indicates, this thing about how she doesn't know the shape and size of his sex, she calls it, we also don't know from this image. Um, that, so because of the uh, concealment we imagine is happening here, um, also we could get in, there's also, I think, just a strange shape happening, you know, or there's, it, I'm not, I don't think it's distorted exactly with a lens or anything, but it does start, like, this recedes back in this funny way where it seems really small, and this seems really large. I mean, I think it has to do with where the camera's placed, and it's just, this is reading a lot bigger. Also, it makes you just wonder where these arms went, you know, and why they're not there, um, especially this one. Like, is that comfortable to be like that? What is that? What's that? What's behind his back? What yeah, yeah. Well, there's just like a bunch of appendages that aren't present here, <laughs> not, just, not just the penis. Um, and then also, I think I noticed a lot, I mean, I also thought a lot about how it worked within the space here, like the other artworks I was wondering about. There's a lot of text-based work in the space, that piece over there, that piece over there. There's a lot of pieces that have to do with domesticity or kind of, you know, everyday objects, um, things from everyday life, which this is also about. This piece seems to be about relationships between subjects, you know, and so is this one. Um, that was one thing I was thinking a lot about. Um, also, I guess um, then you get into just questions about, I mean, the things I started to think about as I look longer and longer at it just had to do with, um, you know, there's, there's some basic kind of feminist analysis we can do here. Um, this art history, if we go look around the museum here, is filled with reclining female nudes. This is a very, very common subject for art. This is not a reclining female nude. <laughs> this is a reclining male nude. Less, less common, like infinitely less common. <laughs> so um, especially when the person making the image is a female artist. There's also this thing that comes from film theory, which people have heard about probably, called the female gaze, which has to do with, or the male gaze, which has to do with this film language that we've grown very accustomed to of uh, breaking up female bodies into parts, you know? Like, all you have to do is watch, what did I just see? Um, uh, what's a great example of male gaziness is, uh, what are those car movies where they like drive fast cars, Fast and Furious? I go to everything, and so, and, um, and I just sit, I, it's a way to get out the hate, you know, and so, um, so Fast and Furious is great for that kind of stuff. Some people actually, there's some things that are fun about those, but, but anyway, but it's very much like, there's butts, like, jiggling, there's, like, the legs, like, the women, a lot of female bodies get introduced in parts, and then you finally see the whole thing, you know. Male bodies aren't usually introduced that way. This is doing that a little bit. Like we have this, it's, they're make, that, what that's called is making it into an object, you know? Like it's a part, it's a part, it's an object, it's an object. This is doing that a bit, right? We don't have a head, they're kind of, we don't have that sense of personality and identity. Um, it does feel like an object, it feels like this piece of meat or something like that, right? Um, so there's that way of thinking about it. Um, also, I think, I mean, I think I just, some things I think about with this when I put on, you know, so I can put on this lens of gender. If I put on this lens of like class or economy, I start to think about how this piece might be trying to express what intimacy is like under the current economic system we have, you know, under capitalism. Relations are strained, sexuality is stunted, you know, <laughs> like some people might you could get that from this, you know, or from all of her work, you know. She's attempting to relate to people and it's not always working out, you know. And why, why would that be, you know, if we had a culture that valued relating 
more, even primarily, as a human thing to do, you know, over like making money or competing with other people, it may be that this art would not make sense, you know, this art wouldn't even happen. Um, that's one way I started to think about this, like that it's a lot about like the attempt at relating that is feels impossible um, or just keeps failing. Yeah. Well, uh, what comes to mind, I mean, like, listening to you talk about her, her relationships with, with, uh, with men and with just her, her subjects, it's like, uh, it almost seems like she's, she's going from this uh, serial ad hoc relationship kind of thing, you know, it's just sort of, whatever happens, that's the relationship I'm in. You know? Yeah. And, and, and it's sort of a, as a symbol of, of the kinds of relationships that, that we in our society end up with. Yeah. By default. Feels that way. Does that make any sense? Yes, definitely. <laughs> I think a lot of us have been there too, you know. Um, so, so that's one thing, yeah, but just we could talk a lot more about that, like about the ethics of her entire project here. You could analyze it that way and judge it, or you can just say like, what is this evidence of, you know? Like the ethics are there, okay, you know, but what is it evidence of, you know, hostility that's pent up that is like being sublimated and being expressed through these, you know, and Disconnect. Mm -hmm. in, our, in our culture because of capitalism. Because That's what of I the think. the structure of, mm -hmm. of our economy and how that affects mm -hmm. our emotions and, 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 and our, you know, the difference between transactional relationships and transformative relationships. I think that's a really crucial point to consider. Interesting. I mean, we just took some big leaps here into like, yeah, what's this all mean, you know? Do other people want to say what it all means or any ideas? I don't know about what it all means, but uh -huh. it's uh -huh. Or like being like asked to think about the levels of class. Uh -huh. I can't help but see sort of some leisure moments, like just like the, the swimsuit. Like yeah, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh huh. Uh huh. The way that of the course. Sheets print at the very bottom, uh -huh. and the way it folds, telling you they're probably silk sheets. Uh huh. So like for someone to be in a relationship with, with someone that already has leisure is very difficult because you're dealing with class at the highest level. What happens when we have access to all material things? Right. Um, like what draw do we have? to be able to draw somebody else out of that. And it seems as if like part of the competition is within the leisure. Mm -hmm. The competition? The competition but for attention or affection. Mm -hmm. uh, because if it's about a breakout, then there's a competition of affection. Mm -hmm. And if somebody has leisure, I think that's a very difficult thing to be with. I see. Yeah, that's interesting. That yeah. Yeah, we could keep on this class tip. I hadn't noticed that. Thank you for the, the bikini line there. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. My, my perception of it is more sensory. Yeah. Um, and given that you're, you're, you know, really all we see is this sort of fragment of the body. Mm -hmm. Like a torso. Tor 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 I mean, it would come to my mind, but I don't think it's really true. You know, these, these ancient torsos that we see. Right. Right. That's true. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, it just seems fleeting and fragmentary. Mm-hmm. Even the text, I mean, the way the text is formatted, the way the photograph is sitting on the floor. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I hear you. I hear that. Yeah. Other thoughts? Yeah. Right. But at the same time, she's producing these things that give us these sort of new, sometimes empathetic experiences that are sort of good. Because there's a lot of art that is like this that I don't like, you know, because it doesn't have take that next step to make something for me, you know, as a viewer to engage with and sit with for a long time and see many things in. Yeah, like, see, I think that's an important part of it. I don't know why I like this so much, all her stuff. Yeah. It's some, there's some, t some place it goes that is beyond what other stuff like this does. That yeah, and then like, like you said, the, the production quality, like it's, she's making aesthetic decisions here and producing 
Mm -hmm. Was it like a you know full work of art? And like this one in particular does seem to be a little aware of like how she's breaking from up with mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She's taking the head out, she's taking some of the mm -hmm. body parts instead of a whole person. Mm -hmm. A fragmented relationship. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. So she's like taking control. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And we're looking at it with like, there's something, I think there's something like perhaps unconscious that's hitting us. It's like, oh, there's like this empathetic quality that's drawn from it, but why is that? And I think a lot of that has to do with like, oh, this person is clearly like wrong or something. Mm hmm. I guess there's something like there's a subtle like feminist impulse or something in her you know or just different from other feminist art we're used to seeing um, that is is just more I don't just clear about some of these you know like this is what I think of patriarchy you know there's just but it's there too you know um, yeah mm -hmm. do you, people have other thoughts I know that we may be getting close to the time we're supposed to wrap up. <laughs> um, um, it's very interesting to talk with you about this piece. Keep looking. Oh well, yeah, yeah. Mhm. Mm mhm. Mm mhm. Mm um. Yeah. I mean, I also see connections to like other French kind of wandering, you know, threads in art history, like the Flaneur and the situation. I mean, this is maybe not this piece exactly, you know, but a lot of, but in a way, like a lot of her work has to do, a lot of that work has to do with, you know, moving about the city in a way that, you know, is about floating and noticing new things you didn't notice before and isn't it full of pleasures that we didn't know about, but it also really assumes a very privileged male position that is not threatened by being in public spaces and that kind of thing, and she kind of occupies that. Like, that's kind of another way that address book is sort of functioning, is like, I'm going to be that flinner guy who happens upon something, and but I'm going to do something with this, you know? Um, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, so I guess maybe to bring it back around, I mean, we are supposed to talk a little bit about how, or not supposed to, but how this, what our own work is connect, connect how it's connected to this. I mean, um, I told a couple of people as we were, as you guys were walking in that, um, you know, one pro project I've been, I, and basically since this time in my life when I was in graduate school working on stuff like this, I have been finding different ways to set up a situation in which to 
document things, you know? Um, and that can be anything from I'll make a video every month to I'll make a video every day to I'll gather people around to uh, make something happen together. Um, I'm doing something like this in a few weeks. Um, so, and especially using my own life as source material for art, which is what is a basic thing about her work that's happening that is maybe happening in all artists' work, but is like pretty explicit here with like some autobiographical details. So I um, do a lot of work like that, where I'm using my own life as like a subject or a kind of taking a distance on it to try to see, be like an anthropologist of my own activities, you know, and so um, you can check it out if you want. I brought my business card. <laughs> um, I have a project, especially maybe that might be of interest if you're into some of this stuff, of uh, where I make a video every single day that is, you know, sometimes just documenting making oatmeal, sometimes it's my trip to the art museum, sometimes it's being on the bus. So, um, and then I make a monthly video out of those videos. And all of this is mainly just to have a practice, you know, just to always be looking and always be experiencing, like trying to like stop and be aware of wherever I am and what could I make here, what is really here, that kind of thing. And I do more than one a lot of days. They're not all that great, but I put some of them online. Um, and uh, I do screenings of them and different stuff like that. And then a lot of those become other more formed diary pieces um, too that, ha that use a lot of text also, you know, I'm really interested in that too, like how these different systems can express differently, you know, and, I've, and we just need them both, or I do, you know. Um, I started out as a writer before any of this visual art stuff, so I'm still very connected to language and words, and I'm interested in seeing it as a visual art, too, or as a visual form. Um, so that's the follow-up. You can go watch the movies online and uh, look at my other projects, too. Um, if you want to go have a drink, I guess that's what we're doing, right? Yeah. Thanks so much for coming. <laughs>